here's the best way to phrase it. Trump did what he needed to do tonight. Could he have done a little bit better? Sure. Yeah. But he, it also could have been a lot worse. And yes. he, he avoided a disaster. He avoided stepping in it. And I think he, he did gain some momentum, which is good mm-hmm. moving forward because this was the last big planned stand where he has – he, he has a guaranteed audience of people that are at least somewhat undecided or, or somewhat, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily pay attention to politics year round that were watching this. And I think that that was important. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Uh, the mute, the mic mute did appear to work at least for a time, but there were harsh clashes on health care, the minimum wage, children separated at the border under the Okay, I'm stepping off of this point there. And, and the, the purpose of the mute should not be race. to keep the clashes uh, from happening. No. The clashes are what a debate is. It should keep it from getting out of hand. Racist presidents so, modern times, the well, but again, going back to the Lincoln, to the, uh, to the Kennedy-Nixon and debate, team, they actually they sat down between the times they were answering. And if you had a bit, if you had a, two different people asking the question, if you had two different people asking the questions, you would have a timer in the middle that doesn't that doesn't say anything. And he would just be, you got two minutes, you have one minute. You have two minutes, you have one minute. And you would that's how you would work it out. And it would be no crosstalk. Because there really doesn't need to be crosstalk. But I mean I, I, I mean I would people hate. want the crosstalk the, pe- the, the debate commission wants you to think that they that people don't want the crosstalk, but people do want the crosstalk. People do want the crosstalk, and I don't have a problem with the crosstalk as long as it doesn't get to the point that it did in the last debate to where they're just yelling over one another. It, it was good tonight. Anybody. It was good tonight. Yeah, tonight, uh, I do think the format helped it. I Here's one question that I'll pose to y'all because I have an answer in, in my head, so I'll just give you mine first. Uh, I actually think that if they had – not announce the muted thing, like if they hadn't muted the mics or anything like that, it would have looked almost exactly the same. I think that Trump like went into this knowing that he couldn't do what he did in the last debate because there were several times yeah. where it didn't appear that his mic was muted, that Trump just let Joe Biden speak. And so I don't That's think right. that the muting of the mic was actually necessary. Uh, it may have helped one or two times, but I really don't think that it, it made that big it difference. Might help in the, it might help in the post-spin well, Trump didn't talk because he knew he was going to be muted. That, but that's still just spin. It's not actual. It's not actual uh, something you can prove in one way or another. True. And I think that that where the mute came in and affected the debate in a positive manner was in the prep. Um, in prepping mm-hmm. for the debate, Trump knew he was going to be muted. Uh, and that kept him from overextending himself, from mm-hmm. looking more like he's just pecking right. at Joe Biden over and over and over right. again like he did in the first debate. So you think that it may not have actually made a game day effect, but it may have made a difference in the way that the practice was held? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I can see uh, that. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's true or not or if we can ever know that or not, but and, it's an and interesting that, yeah, and I think the only people that are going to know this are, are – our Trump's campaign team and his well, debate yeah. prep. Yeah, his staff, and that gets to my point but from before the debate that I don't, that I think that the, the mute button is going to help Trump is because it, it even if it's only a, a game, you know, the way he did the game plan prep, it still matters. You know, it's 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 a factor. Yeah, it's 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 the it's it's the manager of the World Series team deciding, you know, which pitchers are going to be on the roster for that for that seven for those seven games. I mean, the, and he he knew he had to be on his game, and man, he was on his game. He he was he was uh, he was sharp. He was I won't say respectable because we're still talking about Trump, but he was <laughs> reserved, certainly for him. Sure, he was he he, he went after Biden with specifics. Mm-hmm. I mean. Now, if I were on the Biden campaign staff and in the debate prep on the Biden side, I would have used the mute in a completely different way. I would have continued to peck at Trump. I would have continued to forget the mute because Trump can still hear Biden. And yeah. it, the second and Biden Trump, can still hear Trump. Yeah. It, but the second that Trump starts to get riled up, 
That's when he loses yeah. his cool. That's when he doesn't look presidential. That's when he looks like he's getting catty. That's right. Um, and and I think the Biden team could have used that to advantage their advantage because the American people wouldn't have heard it, but Trump would have. Right. Yeah, I I think that that's a fair point. Uh, before we do go any further, because I got a couple more follow up questions for you guys, and we'll talk about who we think won the debate and what they needed to do to try to persuade voters that are still on the fence. Before we do that. I do have to mention our fantastic sponsors, Chappie's Deli. Guys, thank you so much for sponsoring this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> got our got our merch here, the Chappie's Deli sweet tea that they provided us with, giant sandwich tray, which I had like, I don't know, three or four different sandwiches. Every single one was fantastic, even though they were different. I had, uh, let's see, oh, the pastrami one. I've never had a pastrami sandwich uh, from Chappie's, and pastrami. it was really good. <laughs> that was Probably the best pastrami I've ever had. That's mostly because there's no pastrami there by the time you go when I've already been there. See, that's, that's what it was. <laughs> Last time I didn't get to the sandwiches until after the debate because I was busy on setup. That's right. Now I know why. I just thought the last one didn't have any pastrami. Turns out it was Brian. Right. <laughs> but no. Uh, uh, let's see. I had a ham. I had a turkey. Um, man, and, and it's just all fantastic. It's much better. And I consider myself pretty good at making sandwiches. I've been doing it for a long time. I can't make a sandwich like Chappie's. I just yeah. can't do it. And so that's something. Half the time when I go to a deli or a sandwich place, I'm eating like, man, I paid like seven or eight bucks for this, and I could make this at home. Not true at Chappie's. Not true at Chappie's. Uh, yeah. Lots of specialty breads. And uh, another thing that I love about them, because they are a local business, they treat you like family. They treat the customers as though it's important because they're a local business. They can't get away with treating people like crap. They can't do it like a franchise. They have to treat you like you're important or they would lose their business. David Barranco is one of the top-notch people in this town, and he instills that culture in the entire organization. I mean, it, it really is. So Yeah, top to bottom, you really can't right. beat a staff like Chappie's. That's right. Um, they got the best service. They've got the... The, so I've eaten at Chappie's probably hundreds of times in my <laughs> life, having grown up in Montgomery and moved back here as an adult. Um, there are Chappies in Birmingham, though, aren't there? Uh, there are Chappies in Birmingham. I don't Auburn, think there are anymore. There's, there used to be. There used to be, but yeah, Auburn any. and Prattville are the only locations yeah. outside of Montgomery. Yeah. Sucks to be you, Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but no, like having gone to Chappies from a young child. Uh, to an to a young adult, um, you know, there I've literally never had a bad experience at Chappie's, and any time I came close to having a bad experience, I got a free meal out of it, and they made it right. Yeah, yeah and that's just the kind of people that they are. I've always had, like, like you said, never had a bad experience with it, and been nothing but pleasant. And another thing that I wanted to mention, sort of on top of that, is uh, Chappie's. I, I think that people sometimes forget their menu is huge. Yeah. So if oh, you have the Buffalo City wrap, are you kidding me? There are very <laughs> few better wraps in town than right. the Buffalo City. But I mean, they've right. got casseroles, they've got breakfast, they've got, right. they've got all these different things. And so if you've got a big group of friends that you want to get together right. after church or something like that, there's something there for everybody. It's, You're not going to go after church because they are closed. On they Friday. are closed on Sundays. Yeah. I meant Wednesday night. Oh, there we go. Sorry, oh. I was thinking of like midweek Bible yeah. study. Yeah, you're right. They are closed on Sundays. But yeah, anyway, check them out. Five locations. Auburn, Pepper Tree, Baptist South, Perry Hill, Prattville. That's Prattville. it, the fifth of them. Yeah. yeah, so plenty of locations around the River region to serve you. And keep in mind, with this pandemic and everything that really hurt a lot of local businesses, local businesses really need your help right, right. now. So the next time that you're at work or whatever and you're wondering where we need to go to eat lunch, you know, consider a local business like Chappie's, one that gives back to the community. And I, I guarantee you're not going to be disappointed with the product or the service. Right. All right, so on this debate, who won? Simple as that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Trump won. Uh, he he followed the he followed the Gus Malzahn strategy. He got a big lead and held on. Uh, they, the first question he completely dominated the COVID question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he dominated it more than 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 Pence did, uh, and he was. And and Biden was playing catch up from there, and he never got Trump off his game. So I think Trump won this rather handily. Uh, personally, I think 
I think we're scoring the game a little differently okay. um, because I think from well, this a is subjective, so that's okay. from a pure debate perspective. From uh, if you are just taking the debate on its face, I think that Trump probably uh, probably squeaked a win out, like you said, because of an early yeah. lead on that first question. Yeah. Um, but I think the true winner is determined in the spin, like I said earlier, and I think that Biden actually out catch phrase Trump in that debate because there were several times where he very much looked the camera square in the face, looked to, right into your Amer- the American people's homes, and he said what you want to hear out of a presidential candidate. Um, it might not have been on topic. It might not have been exactly uh, what needed to be said at the time, um, but I think that he, he gave – his spin doctors in the the liberal media uh, some really good sound bites to play over and over and over again and to spin in his favor. Um, and and that will raise the question of can the Trump spinners, and they're already in action. I've already been watching them on Twitter. Can the Trump oh, spinners sure. can the Trump spinners hang the outright lies that Joe Biden said on him? The fracking one is the easiest one because he said it in Democratic debates. Right. That's the easy You can one. put together right. a 30-second uh, a montage of Joe Biden saying over and over again, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels, we're going to get rid of and, fracking. And, that, and, one's, but, that one's an easy one. You're so, right. So the, the point being that, that you, I think you're, you've got a good point. Plus, boy, Trump had one – I'm trying to remember what it was. Trump had really one turkey. It was when he, uh, when he called Mexicans yeah, stupid. Yeah, that that's, that's, that's gonna, what it's going to be. That's going to be – Mexicans that's gonna are be, stupid. That will be the most played clip tomorrow, I guarantee yeah. it. Yeah. Um, On both sides uh, probably. I, but uh, just because yeah. you know, the, Trump, the Trump people will be defending it, the, the other side will be – Well, and, uh, and it's, one of those, it. it's one of those things where if you, if you give a fair – view of the context that he said he's not wrong but it's something you really don't want to say and it because because it makes it look really bad to say only stupid mexicans follow the law i mean that's really a bad thing to say and it's going to it's going to that and on top of it they'll be able to spin the hesitancy as well cuz you may remember when he answered yeah. that he hesitated, and he says, I, I don't really like to say this, but now the reason that he hesitated, there's there's the reason, and then there's the reason the, peop- uh, the the media pundits will get. Right. The real reason is he knows that it's going to be spun badly, which is the reason that he shouldn't have said it. Which is why he would have only said – which is why his, his proper answer would have been only the very honest ones showed up. Mm-hmm. That would be – that's a much better answer. Though. But the, the way that it's going to be spun is, well, see, here's what's happening. The president knows that he's racist. He knows that what he's saying is racist, but he didn't want to say it because he doesn't want people to think that he's racist. That's how they're going to spin it. It's not true, right. but that's right. how they're going to play it. So right. to both of your points about Trump doing better in the opening, I think that we do kind of have to look at this from a couple of different vantage points. To anybody that actually sat down and watched the debate, because over and over again, and this has been true for decades, most people don't watch the whole debate. Right. They watch maybe the first 30 minutes, and then viewership dramatically drops off after right. that. And, I'll and if say, you just saw the first 30 minutes of that debate, it looks like Trump smoked it. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it wasn't even close. And I'll say from a college student perspective as well, it's like watching the debate, thinking, what am I, what's going to grab a certain audience's attention? What audience are they targeting in this debate is my thing. Because to me, as a college student, look at this, the 18, 24-year-old spectrum, I don't see much difference in where I'd be voting because they didn't really appeal too much. Health care and some other things, yes, that – Kind of grabs our attention, but the younger voting voter age group, I say, you did not really grab too much attention tonight. Well, I think neither candidate really gave a whole lot of red no. meat to that particular demographic, no. um, and that's partly because that's not a really big voting block. Yeah, to be perfectly honest. Well, and also where you where you hit that voting block is on social media, is in ads. Um, it's going to be those thirty second clips that yeah, you're right for a younger generation, which I'm a part of. Our attention span is not terribly great. It's not going. To, we're not going to sit through an hour and a half long debate. Uh, there are not many eighteen to twenty four, eighteen to thirty year olds that are going to sit through and watch the entire we're in debate. college. Yeah. So we're more busy about that. I'm thirty one. I can count on probably one hand, if not two, the number of friends that I have that watch the whole thing beginning to end. Oh yeah, uh, if that. 
two two hands is a max. T- for two me. hands is the absolute uh, max, and and we're both politically savvy and have friends that are involved in politics, and that's true for both of us. Right. So you're right on that. Um, they probably didn't play much to that, and that's probably because they know that this isn't the format to do that anyway. So that that is a factor to take into consideration. But if I'm just looking at who won the debate, obviously that's not really going to be known to us until the polls, but um, I think that the winner here is Trump for two reasons. The first being that, like I was pointing to a second ago, for the the people that actually did watch the debate and they only watched the first 30 minutes, man, I mean, there's just no comparison. Trump destroyed Biden in the first 30 minutes. And and he did it on a, on a, on a, he did it on a subject that he actually – is generally vulnerable on mm-hmm. with the COVID. I mean, because because a bad, a really bad thing happens, the incumbent president is has got it's going to stick to his hands. I mean, he can't get away from it. But he didn't he didn't shy about oh I'm you know woe is us we had a bad thing happen to us under my presidency. He had a this is what we're doing to fix it. Yeah, it's bad, but we're we it wasn't real it wasn't it was neither unrealistic. About its about how how rosy scenario is, but it was specific about what they are doing. But then again, a well, nation in the middle of a crisis or just off of a crisis historically will reelect an incumbent president. Um, that's pretty par for the course. That that's generally true. Um, as think, long as the as long as the incumbent is somewhat optimistic about the future getting correct. out, correct? Because um, because if you look at Carter and Bush forty one. That's not what happened. The, the 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 crisis created a in Carter a, a sense that he that he was not big enough for the for the for the office, and with Bush forty one a sense that Bush was bored with the office, and that was not what Trump that's not what Trump portrayed tonight. Yeah, but the the second half of that and the reason that I think that that Trump really pulled out a W here. Is that um, he stopped the bleeding and then some? Yeah. Because the the polls showed that after that first debate performance, Trump dropped significantly in the polls. He was yeah. pulling. He, he, I mean, he was still behind, but he was yeah. making up a lot of ground. There were there yeah. were several key states where he was he, only behind by four or five points. He lost a week, and and he went down to you know minus eleven in some of yeah. those states, and. There were two things that I think have been a saving grace so far. One was Amy Coney Barrett and the confirmation hearings and everybody making such a big deal about them. She may be, and this is weird, but this may be the first time a Supreme Court nomination has actually helped the president get elected in a very, like, you can draw a one-to-one. You don't have to do any dot connecting. Like, it's, it's a straight line between the nomination and yeah. President Trump. And then tonight... President Trump showed it's not just good Supreme Court nominations. I can, you know, hold my own and I don't have to run over the other person and be a bully like I was in the first one. And so he really did some damage control tonight, which Trump desperately needed. So I I think that he actually won tonight. And remember, I'm the only one on the panel of five that said Biden won the last one. Right, that's true. So uh, I'll tell you what, if you were to take Amy Coney Barrett and switch her with Brett Kavanaugh, Trump would be done. Completely right. and totally done. That's, it would that's be correct. over nail, final nail in the coffin. I think Amy Coney Barrett is that's Trump's right. biggest asset right now, and he needs to tout her all the way to the back. I was well, wildly proof of that, critical. I was wildly critical of President Trump for nominating Kavanaugh instead of Amy Coney Barrett, and given the information that we had at the time, I still think I was correct in my analysis on that. But. If nothing else, just sure as hell worked out for him. Man, did that help him out? Well, he sure could not. Out he him. could. I mean, he, you're you're absolutely right. Kavanaugh would sink his presidency if it was if he was the one coming up forward. I'm not sure anybody else could have. I mean, I, maybe maybe Bill Pryor could have could have helped him out. Possibly, but maybe, but but only because Bill Pryor really only because Bill Pryor took down uh, uh, Roy Moore. So, I mean, Maybe. so so he's not – what I'm saying is that that gives him protection from the left. I think Bill Pryor would, would sail through confirmation more than anybody else, but – more than anybody else that Trump could, could, could put up. But I, I, but I totally agree with you. Amy Coney Barrett 
was the type of nominee he needed to have that that people could run on and be a, and be a successful. And the proof of that is the question was asked and nobody talked about it. I mean, the the question to the question was to Biden about the future of the Supreme Court, and all of a sudden they were on a completely different subject. Biden did not want to brace. He he did not attack. And that is a marked change from the past week. Well, that's, where that both is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on multiple occasions went after that. Right. It is. It is not, not what it that is. tells you is somebody got some polling data. Mm-hmm. Well, what what there were there were flash probably because there were flash polls today about what the Democrats did in the Judicial Committee about not showing up for the vote. And that looked bad. Poor form. That's Very really poor, poor form. form. And, and, I, and, also, and, and they did not, he didn't want to, and he got, he finally got into, I'm going to pack the court, I'm going to increase the, poor, the, the court, and that's a loser argument. And also, another thing too, that probably hurt them on that as well, Chuck Schumer and his response saying that I had a stern talk with Dianne Feinstein about how she handled that, literally just being a decent human being. Right. Uh, to why did I just lose his to, name? To Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. Yeah, yeah, to Lindsey Graham. Uh, j- just hugging him and saying, "Look, we we dis- Diane Feinstein is still going to vote against I, Amy Coney." I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think this that was a case of Democratic pollsters saw that and said, "Wow, this is this is a loser argument." Which I, I don't want to get way off into the weeds here, although we kind of already have. Um, but. How how much does it say to Democrats' character that they had to have pollsters tell them that attacking an incredibly successful federal judge who is a mom of seven and has two adopted children of a different race than her was a really dumb idea? Like, well, <laughs> how the, did they the, not? The problem is know they that? had no they had no choice but to appease their base that was going to be mad at they. See, Donald, Donald Trump. That, Donald Trump could have. Donald Trump could have reincarnated uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the Democrats would have been mad about Donald Trump nominating her. I mean, they, they, it's it's not about it's not about Trump. It's not about the the person. It's about Trump. And Amy Coney Barrett defanged that. She she, she really, really did. I mean. The, she hold up. The, she held up the the, the card. Holding up a blank piece of paper <laughs> that was, was incredible. And it and it I ended. Mean, the, it ended the, the. I mean, they kept talking, but it really ended the whole thing. Yeah, well, I mean, she is by like I said earlier, she is by far Trump's biggest asset right now, and he needs to ride her the whole way through if he wants to win this election. Well, what you were saying earlier, Mike, about it being more about the spin and the reaction than the actual thing itself. A very, very, very tiny percentage of the American population actually watched Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation hearings. But how many spin. people saw the card? And if you're, if how you're many on the memes, left, what how many memes that? have you seen mm-hmm. with Amy Coney Barrett holding up something, it, saying but, something, whatever it is? Yeah. My, my favorite one is if you're if you're a sports guy, there was a Super Bowl several years ago with the Seattle Seahawks and. Uh, 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 the, they had a running back. I can't remember his name. It was Marshawn, Marshawn Lynch. Lynch. He, in the pregame, in the two day before press availability, they kept asking him questions. His only response was, I'm only here so I don't get, get fined. Fine. <laughs> and so somebody put that on the card. <laughs> that is I'm only here oh, because perfect. I don't get fined. <laughs> but, but to the larger point, here's the thing, and I, I'm going meta a little bit here, but I think it's appropriate to understand how important that was. Because I, I agree with you too that it, I mean, it was absolutely instrumental and it, it stopped the bleeding on the Trump campaign. Um, the thing that is so important about Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Scalia, Justice Clarence Thomas are symbols of natural law, originalism, mm-hmm. and constitutionalism. I right. mean, if you were to think right. of people that sort of represent that, it's those guys. Amy Coney Barrett is all of that and. In concert with being that, she is also the physical embodiment of it, because right. she lives out that natural law. And and that's with that's really even even recognizing that I don't think there will ever be a serious challenge to Obergefell in in gay marriage. I don't think there ever will be a challenge for it. I mean, I just I think like there will never be a serious challenge to Roe. 
I mean, I, well, I, no, there will be serious challenges. No, the Alabama law, is, the Alabama law is actually designed to be a serious challenge. It was I don't designed know that, that way, but it's never. I don't it, know that it'll it, ever it get gets to the Supreme Court. I don't see a way that it but, ever but overturns. There's, it. but, but Obergefell is really. I mean, they talked a lot about super, uh, super precedents in her confirmation hearing. Okay, and they talked about Roe as the Democrats latched on to Roe as a super precedent. The reality is that Obergefell is a super precedent. There's never going to be a challenge to it because because I well, because it, I, I I just don't think I, I mean I don't necessarily I don't necessarily agree that it was well decided. Well, it wasn't well decided. It wasn't well decided. But I, but the point being that that you now have a, a you now have people that are relying on that, and nobody's going no no state is going to raise a you know raise a, a, a challenge that tells, you know, 10,000 of their couples that are in their state, you're no longer married. And I just, I just don't see that ever happening. It's, that's a pr purely practical terms. It's yeah, not, I mean, that's a state politician's, you know, death sentence, right? Yeah, well, look, it, Roy, would, Moore, Roy Moore it? ran on that and, and it didn't get him over the hump. Of course, there were other things. There, that there were extenuating but, circumstances. Right, with but Roy Moore, Moore also, he was, he was, he was he won the Republican primary against a really bad candidate, a really vulnerable candidate, well, and a terrible field, and a terrible I, field. Trust me, I worked for one of those candidates. It was a terrible field. Uh, which I, I'll tell. I'll ask after which one you <laughs> yeah, worked for. I'm, I'm curious about that too. That was my first instinct. Um, but the thing is, super precedent is. It has been there so long that undoing it is basically impossible, and also there is no serious uh, contention as to whether or not. Like for example, school segregation is, yeah, is a Brown. good example of, of super precedent that it's to the point right. that there's no serious challenges. To and that's there. what the definition was, was not that anymore. It is not that yet. It may be one day. I, I and I think you're right. I don't that think there's don't, not a state politician that wants to make that their hill to die on. You're 100 percent correct. I, on that's that. what I and that's what I mean. Yeah. There, look. Look, I've had I've been on Kevin's show, and I've had black people God bless call you me. For that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've had, I, when I would go on on Monday mornings when we would talk politics and not the the monthly Thursday uh, religious part. Yeah. Um, I would I would have people call black people call up and say we need to resegregate the schools. So yeah, there are people out there that want to resegregate the school. Yeah, a handful of random nuts. Right, but, but right. I but think the, Caleb but, said it perfect. No, no politician no wants this to be the no hill they die on. No politician's going to be the hill to die, the die on. Yeah. O overall, though, um, with this re-election campaign, because I, I do think that it's important to have this conversation just because of, of how instrumental the Supreme Court has been yeah. um, to, to all of this. And I think the American people really got to see – a person like Amy Coney Barrett that believes in natural law, believes in universal rights, that we have these rights because they're given to us by God. The Constitution just protects all of that. Right. But the difference in seeing a Thomas or a Scalia and seeing an Amy Coney Barrett is that you see her sort of playing that out in real time. And so she becomes more of a symbol than just a person that knows it. And – um the reason that that is so good for Trump is because it's a worldview thing. People remember symbols. They, they they can understand narratives better than they can understand an explanation. Well, and from a conservative perspective, like how perfect is it that the person Amy Coney Barrett replaces is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who embodied the left more than any Supreme Court mm -hmm. justice we have seen ever. And Amy I mean, Coney she Barrett literally became a cultural icon. Yes, just like Amy Coney I mean, Barrett she became the notorious to. RBG. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally became a cultural icon. Um, and Amy Coney Barrett is the polar opposite and embodies everything that the right stands for. Yeah, right. And and so I do think that that has been important for Trump's. Re-election, but I guess that kind of leads me to the the final question of the evening, which is, what does Trump have to do now? Because this was Trump's last biggest known opportunity. He has plenty of other opportunities. I'm not saying that he doesn't have other opportunities to make inroads with voters, but this is the last big official event. Anything else he does, he has to come up with on his own. So what should Trump do now? What should his focus be between now and election day on how to win over those? 
you know, people that are either still on the fence or maybe even pull away some people that are in the Biden camp right now. He's got to stay on. He's got to stay on the attack and then in the in on the on the stump. He he has been he has been very good over the last what is it, a week and a half really after he got out of the hospital. Yeah, he's been a hundred percent on message. He's been a hundred percent on message. He has to stay there. He has to stay on message and he has to stay on the stump. And he has to make it clear that he's the one that's that's the that's the leader that's gonna that's that's gonna walk into not gonna be afraid not gonna be uh, you know the 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 hitchhiker's guide don't panic he's got to be that <laughs> guy he's got to be the guy that stands up and says you know I, we've got we've got this we can beat this we can keep going. He's got to keep that momentum up. I think the I think the debate helped him in that. He did not undo any of that today. No, I, I think he made not a massive gain, but I think that it wasn't a touchdown, but it was a really impressive drive that it ended in points on the board. Yeah, uh, that's I think, right. I think that that's fair. Uh, he, I'm not sure it wasn't a touchdown. I mean, he may have ex- missed the extra point, but I think <laughs> it, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I I could maybe even see that. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's sort of a subjective thing. But yeah. uh, here's the best way to phrase it: Trump did what he needed to do tonight. Could he have done a little bit better? Sure. Yeah. But he it also could have been a lot worse. And yes, he he avoided a disaster. He avoided stepping in it. And I think he he did gain some momentum, which is good mm-hmm. moving forward because. This was the last big planned stand where he has he, he has a guaranteed audience of people that are at least somewhat undecided or, or somewhat, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily pay attention to politics year round that were watching this. And I think that that was important. Mike. So I'm glad you made the football reference of <laughs> scoring a touchdown. Hey, it works in Alabama. Everybody gets it. Being in Montgomery, I'm reminded of my time playing for John Tatum at Montgomery Academy uh, and was blessed enough to do so. And he used to always tell us something when we were up at halftime. Act like you've been here before. Act like you've won a football game before. In my books, if the election were held today, Trump would win partially because of the fact that an incumbent has such a huge advantage, especially an incumbent in a time of crisis, and the confirmation hearings of Amy, Amy Coney Barrett. Um, I, I think Trump is your leader in the clubhouse, to, to throw a golf reference in there. Um, and I think that he really needs to just not screw it up. Um What's going to what's gonna lose it for Trump is going to be getting down in the weeds, getting into a cat fight with Joe Biden, um, and yeah. and losing his presidential look. Which he's got to let other people do he that. He doesn't have a lot of that presidential look because he's not your typical p- politician, but he needs to remain presidential. I think that remaining presidential – is incredibly important and unfortunately sometimes undervalued valued by Trump's base because they don't care whether he looks presidential or not. They just like Trump. And right. I, I'm saying that partly in criticism and, and partly just as a sheer observation. But the thing is, the average American does really care about that. And, and the Trump people, I think Trump has people around him that understand that. And that's part of the reason that he looked a lot better and a lot more presidential, maybe not as presidential as he could have. Uh, but I, I do want to push back a little bit on something you said and see how you react to it, because I, I think that um, you're at least partially right. But I, I do want to sort of um, see what you think about this, since we've already gone with the football reference once tonight. <laughs> um, I think he has to do more than just not screw up. And the reason that I say that is technically Trump is still behind. Now, if you're ahead – then you can just kind of sit on the ball and run some real conservative rushing plays and not throw the ball real deep or anything and just hope to run out the clock. Trump's not really in a position to do that right now. I think that he's a lot closer to taking the lead than he was uh, a couple weeks ago and, and maybe even closer after tonight than that. But I don't think that Trump can just not screw up. I think that obviously that's important. You can't fumble when you're behind. 
but but I think Trump has to go a little bit further than just not screwing up. So my my response to that would be that uh, if you look at the 2016 election, mm -hmm. he is actually closer to Biden than he was to Hillary, and at this point in the election, and I th we touched on it earlier because Trump is such a political anomaly because he will not be reproduced. Um, and his style is so unique. I think he's next to impossible to get an accurate poll on. I don't think that, I think the polls have it wrong again. Um, I think it's going to be a lot like 2016 in the way the polling goes. I think going into election day, Biden is going to be leading in the polls, but we're going to see a Trump victory. I think that Trump is harder to poll than most conventional candidates. But to be fair, in 2016, the polls were pretty accurate. They only missed three states. And they got the national poll off by one. They predicted a Hillary victory by about two to three points. It was a Hillary victory by about one point in the national poll. Now, obviously, that doesn't count. Yeah, the, but my point yeah. is the polls were a lot the more di accurate The difference than being that the polls actually had Hillary winning a majority of the population, which right. she did not. She did not actually. She won more than Trump, but she did not win 50 percent of the voters. Which that, she, she did. What, yeah, that, that's, that's, that, that's that, but, in, but in the polls said that she would. But yeah, that's about so the only difference. Not saying the polls were 100% no, accurate, no, but they were a no. lot more accurate than people remember. And so right. I, I think that it's, right. it's interesting because there are two truths and they kind of contradict each other. But I think right. they can both be true at the same time, which is awkward for me, a logic person, to say. Right. Uh, the first one is it's foolish to count Trump out <laughs> Yeah. It, it, or to think that you've got him pegged down. And then the second one is um, that when it comes to uh, – to polling, it's you ignore it at your own peril. That's true. Um, that's true. So I, I think that that's the case. Now, as far as my observation of what needs to be done from this point on, I do think that you know you can't you can't fumble even if you are behind. Um, I think that Trump's instinct in positions like this is to go on attack, but he's really not done that as much as he normally does, and. What he has been doing for the past week or so since he got back on the campaign trail from, from recovering, like you've said, he's been 100% on message. And I think what he needs to do is he needs to, first of all, push back a little bit on this narrative that um, he's not taking the virus seriously because he's telling people not to panic. Um, he needs to come out with a pretty strong statement on that. And one of the things he ought to bring up is since when has it been a bad idea for the American president to calm people down and tell them that it's going to be all right? That's what FDR did. Um, that's yeah. what. Uh, but he's how, no FDR, but you're right. That right, is exactly but, but what, that's needs, what he has to do. He needs to draw attention to the fact that there have been. He needs to draw attention to the fact that he can be presidential and that this is not something that is some kind of wild anomaly and that the. Democrats are the ones that are fear-mongering and trying to play off of the panic. And he did a pretty good job of that tonight. That's the reason the first yeah. half of that debate went so well. I, I think that the way – I'm sorry. Uh, just one thing real quick. The FDR comparison to that, the thing about FDR is he was presidential. It also, I'd say, extremely transparent. He also had the new tool of radio back then to help him out more than anything got him more out there. Yeah, it, but but of course there yeah, were a lot of – Twitter. Well, the – the, 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 <laughs> FDR took advantage of new technology uh, in that way. I wouldn't call FDR transparent because well, nobody, that's knew, true. nobody knew he was crippled. All the radio signs that. Uh, no, what I would what I would say is that he 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 said uh, he he laid a good foundation for doing what you what you were saying. Mm -hmm. The next step is to say, back in March, the death rate versus the hospitalization rate was this much, and now it's this much. Mm. He, he, can, he can actually point to an improvement, an actual improvement of treatment that has happened over the last seven months that fewer people that are going into the hospital are dying. Fewer people are going to the hospital and are ended up in the ICU. That's a major accomplishment. Has nothing to do with anything Trump did. Okay. But he's the guy on top. That makes very little happened. difference in politics. <laughs> when, when he's the guy on top when it happened. And the argument again, the, you know, the, 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 the Biden argument on the he killed 225,000 people is that 
Trump hasn't made the treatment better. Trump has to get Trump. If I were in his shoes, I would be accenting that as an example of, look, things are getting better. So if, on that, both candidates are playing up a hypothetical. Yeah, you always because, have to. Because Joe Biden is creating this hypothetical world where uh, Trump is the cause of all of that death because if mm -hmm. he had been president, and unfortunately he's actually – for him, he's actually said this before that there would be no COVID deaths if he were president. Right. <laughs> like he actually said that at one point. Well, but he has, is, the, he has, has the luxury insane. of saying that because he's not president. Right, because he wasn't in the seat when that happened. That's right. He can, he can paint this rosy picture that That's right. has no basis in truth whatsoever. That right. everything would have been uh, gum gumdrops and rainbows if he had been right. president when this happened. Trump is has to paint the opposite picture that everything would have been a thousand times worse if he hadn't been in the chair. It's only as good as it is now. And the advantage of Biden is he has nothing to hold him to account because his hypothetical, um, ridiculous as it is, uh, there were no models made on that. What Trump can actually do and what he ought to be doing is point to models that suggested that there were going to be literally millions of dead he, Americans. He did that tonight. Yeah, and he did, he did that tonight. He did that tonight. And he needs to do that more. He That needs to be right. the opening of every media appearance and stump speech that Trump does from here till election day. And the, and the press will complain that the models were never something that was the CDC put out, and it won't matter. And when they do that, he should respond to, well, then why did you guys all want to shut everything down based on models if models right. can't be trusted? That's right. That, his, that is his natural rebuttal to that. Right. So that's what he needs to do. So, guys, I have really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being here and your expert analysis. Byron, thank you for keeping us on the air, punching all the right buttons. So that's going to be it for our analysis. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, guys. Really appreciate it. This is the last one of the season. So the next time we have another sort of roundtable discussion like this will be on election night. Not sure exactly what form that's going to take. I've been in communication with a number of different people to try to work that out. may even happen from Barry Moore's election headquarters, so we're trying to, mm. to see if that'll be a possibility, but we'll give you details on that in the future. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, and in the meantime, stay the course, friends. Go Rays! A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.